Hello, here we are again. We're still in our, uh, you know, quarantine situation, though things are starting to open up a little bit, with caution, of course. So I hope all of you are well. Uh, I, we're going to do our uh, Saturday morning uh, prayer service for May 30th. Uh, this is Saturday of the seventh week of Easter. As you know, uh, this weekend we celebrate Pentecost, which uh, brings to conclusion the uh, Easter season in the church calendar. It is, of course, also the time when the church officially is born, so to speak, though it really begins with Jesus' active ministry and him calling his early apostles and disciples. Uh, however, it does point us to uh, the active mission of the church. Okay? So our first reading today is uh, going to be from Acts, and then the second, the gospel itself, will from, be from John. Uh, before we uh, go to our readings, of course, let us take a moment to quiet ourselves and to offer our opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for calling us to be your people. We sometimes are quite surprised that you chose one of us, or all of us at times. Sometimes we don't feel capable. Sometimes we feel very limited. But even within those limitations, we know that you are working to bring about what you desire, the good of all. We give thanks for all of this in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us begin with our first reading. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When he entered Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jewish people. When they had gathered, he said to them, My brothers, although I had done nothing against our people or our ancestral customs, I was handed over to the Romans as a prisoner from Jerusalem. And after trying my case, the Romans wanted to release me because they found nothing against me deserving the death penalty. But when some of the Jewish elders objected, I was obliged to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no accusation to make against my own nation. This is the reason then that I have requested to see you and to speak with you, for it is on account of the hope of Israel that I wear these chains." He remained for two full years in his lodgings. He received all who came to him with complete assurance, and without hindrance he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The, the response to the following will be, The just will gaze on your face, O Lord. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his searching glance is on humanity. The just will gaze on your face. The Lord searches the just and the wicked, the lover of violence he hates. For the Lord is just, he loves just deeds, the upright shall see his face. The just will gaze on your face, O Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. I will send you the spirit of truth, says the Lord, and he will guide you in all truth. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Peter turned and saw the disciple following whom Jesus loved, the one who had also reclined upon his chest during the supper, and it said, Master, who is the one who will betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? And Jesus said to him, What if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is it of yours? You follow me. So the word spread among the brothers that the disciple would not die, but Jesus had not told them that he would not die. Just what if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is that of yours? It is this disciple who testifies to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true. 
There are also many other things that Jesus did, but if these were described individually, I do not think the whole world would contain the books that would be written. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The readings at first glance are, can be uh, appear a bit puzzling. Here we have Paul enduring the ordeal of imprisonment for what he was teaching and preaching. Uh, many people just simply couldn't believe that Paul was called to this ministry. And it's really quite interesting because uh, when Paul initially starts, there are many in the church who are rather suspicious um, that he is perhaps maybe a mole that we would use today, that in fact he really wasn't a believer, but had he wanted to penetrate the Christian ranks to carry out his uh, duty of bringing many to trial. Well, as it turned out, uh, Paul was the real deal. In fact, uh, we know more about Paul than any of the other apostles, chiefly through uh, Paul's letters. And Paul became really one of the most ardent uh, and hardworking apostles that we have any knowledge about. That's not to say the other apostles weren't doing difficult work. We simply don't have a lot of information about them. And, and, and then we get into John's gospel where the beloved disciple, uh, the one whom Jesus loved, who we really never get uh, to know who he really is. Some have, have suggested that maybe the beloved disciple is every believer, everyone who uh, partakes of the gospel and chooses to follow Jesus and to believe who Jesus is, even though they were not part of his company in the original 12. It, it, it's a hard thing to know for sure. Uh, why wouldn't the name of the beloved disciple be revealed? So we just don't really know who that is, but we do get a sense of this. Jesus says, I want him to remain. What business is of that of yours as to what my will is about that? And that's what strikes me, that God chooses whom God chooses and many times it's not who we think ought to be chosen. Uh, and I taught uh, in a classroom for 40 years religious studies. Uh, I have, uh, first of all, my undergrad was in history uh, and my graduate and doctoral work was in theology and in ministry. And to this day, I've never taught a, 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 in a social studies class per se, except for when I did student teaching. So it's really kind of strange, but what I found was uh, I was always puzzled by the fact that uh, I was called to this ministry always, uh, and it didn't happen until after I was married that I really got a sense of this. And so of course, uh, being called to work in this field as someone who lives a lay lifestyle with a family and so forth, it took an awful lot of understanding on the part of my wife and certainly support that allowed me to pursue this. And uh, I've always been struck by the kind of why me? Why was I the one who was called? And was I really called or is it just am I in a sort of self-delusion? I, I don't think it's self-delusion in a sense because there've been so many little pointers that have come along the way to, to move me in the direction I have been. But I, I can't help but share with folks that um, when you're in this kind of situation, there are times when you doubt yourself or um, you wonder if you've made the right life decisions and so forth because your family's had to sacrifice so much. But more now and then I do get some reassurance from certain things that do occur in my life that seem to point me in this direction. And, and I was puzzling about that. And I was thinking who through history uh, in our church seems to have a, a path where no one could have expected that they would uh, follow Jesus Christ. And one of them that comes to mind is St. Augustine. We often think of St. Augustine as one of the great early church fathers, one of our great thinkers. But prior to him becoming a Christian, uh, he was a young man, wide-eyed, and visited the large cities. Uh, and all of the temptations that a large city has uh, to bestow on a a young and uh, enthusiastic young man. And uh, he was uh, often troubled throughout his life. He was troubled by his excesses as a young man, maybe too much so. But uh, Augustine, no one could have figured that would be his path. 
that he would change his life around. He would ultimately become a, bush, a bishop and, and one of the great theologians of the church's history. And who could also, uh, in a more contemporary vein, what about someone like Thomas Merton? Thomas Merton, a Cistercian monk uh, of the Trappist order, uh, he, and, and led a, a life that no one could have predicted that really knew him. Only perhaps maybe his very intimate friends knew a side of Thomas Merton that others did not. Merton, of course, the great uh, mystic, uh, social, political commentator, uh, and, and great Trappist monk and spiritual leader, uh, just over time uh, saw in his life that there was a deep inner searching. And as a young man, he searched. He, was, he had been orphaned by the time he was 15. He was all alone in the world. And uh, he was looking and, and puzzling about this. Uh, a brilliant man. But as a young man, of course, he too visited the large cities. And, uh, uh, you know, women and were more to his liking than churches and so forth, even though he had some initial stirrings as a young man. Uh, things were going well for me. He was at Oxford University, I believe, and uh, he ended up, unfortunately, uh, getting a, a girl pregnant, and his uncle basically said enough and brought him to the United States and sent him to Columbia University. Uh, he blossomed there in terms of his thinking, but over time, he began more and more to pop into churches and so forth, till eventually he was baptized a Roman Catholic. And then his life took a turn that no one could have anticipated. He went into religious life uh, and ultimately to the Trappists. No one could have foreseen that. And I think this is the thing we need to keep in mind. God will call people to certain tasks and that person may be not someone you expect. And I guess for us, the trick is to accept those who have been called to what they've been called to. Uh, not to worry about that, but to do what you've been called to. You know, Peter was fussing about the beloved disciple and when Jesus finally basically tells Peter, you know, stick to your knitting. Do what you're supposed to do, but I've got plans for this person over here. And I think that's something we need to appreciate. We desperately need that in the church right now. How Jesus will work through us today may be different than he has worked through us over the great 2,000 year span of our history. Ultimately, God works within the context that we live in to call forth people to address the challenges that we face today, as well as to respond to the opportunities that lay in front of us. Right now, we're involved in a world pandemic and as this recording, uh, we have lost 100,000 people to the virus in this country. That's a lot of people. And we know worldwide that the number is upward around near 400,000. These are challenging times, and God may call people whom we don't know or think should be called by God. Remember, it's not always the virtuous who may be called, but those who have led something less than a virtuous life as a sign of God's redemptive power. I think that's important for us to remember. When I was teaching high school, my kids' uh, students would always ask me, what do you do for a thrill on the weekend? What do you do, crack open the Bible and read it? I said, no, I go to a movie. And I, and, and I tried to convince them that I'm just like everybody else, but where my focus is may be different. Uh, I said, I also, yeah, I said, I do a lot of reading and I still do a lot of reading on a wide range of topics because that's my job. That's my ministry. Uh, God has called me to do something. I'm trying to do the best I can with the tools I have, limited to be sure. Uh, and so sometimes I wonder, you know, are you sure about this? You know, saying to God, you know, I'm not really the kind of guy that can maybe pull this off. Uh, but, um, uh, we do what we can do, and, and we, because there's a level of trust we just have to have. Peter was asked to trust God's judgment, and we need to trust it as well. We do that, usually end up in the place we're supposed to be. You know, we don't have to change the world ourselves, but we can be an important instrument in the place we are. Uh, we can, I think, 
for all of us, we can do the good we can do here. It can be sometimes small things or sometimes large things. Whatever God's desire is for us, we just try to trust and do what we can. And at the same time, help to facilitate the ministries of those whom we think maybe don't deserve to be in ministry, but God has thought otherwise. So I would uh, pray for us that we uh, respect God's wishes, not only for ourselves, but for all those to whom sometimes uh, we can't see it right away. Okay? So let's continue. We'll, uh, we'll now continue with prayers of the faithful. Our response will be, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those who are called to serve you in whatever manner you see fit. If it is us, may we respond. If it is someone else, may we support them. We pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For our government, that those who lead us will use wisdom and truth and honesty and kindness as hallmarks of their governing of your people. We pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For our church, as we continue through history, that we acknowledge our past sins, ask for your forgiveness, and convert our hearts so that we may better serve you in the issues and challenges that face us this day. We pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For all those health care givers who minister to those who are very sick during this pandemic, we pray for them and their families and to all to whom they minister. We pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who are away from their families and for those who have lost their jobs, we pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who have died this past week, may their families be consoled by the trust and knowledge that you have taken them to yourself and they now share in the eternal banquet, we pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for calling us to your service and we ask you to give us the strength to respond to whatever you call us to do. May we trust in you, especially in these hard times. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your son and our brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You guys have a good weekend, uh, stay safe and have a very blessed Pentecost.